my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page physics adda and uh, youtube channel pritam kumar das i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar so good afternoon to all here in bangladesh and a very good evening to all those who are watching this program live from australia so hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic as we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation and situation are becoming uh, very worse so we have to maintain our health rule so our student i think you have uh, already come to know that uh, our department department of physics pabna university of science and technology has already started its online program and uh, we we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation as we, we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus since march 2020 due to the covid so we have already successfully completed our 146 international physics webinar including two nobel laureate speaker and today it's our 147 international physics webinar today is very important day for our department today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between the department of physics pabna university of science and technology and the department of physics and astronomy macquarie university sydney uh, australia uh, we have with us today richard degrees uh, professor department of physics and astronomy macquarie in university uh, sydney australia and he has already connected with us so i'd like to welcome our speaker sir uh, good afternoon and good evening to your part uh, thanks for accepting our invitation sir and yeah we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the department of physics pabna university of science and technology sir for accepting our invitation it's it's my pleasure actually sir and it's my honor and privilege to host you in our international physics webinar so for those who are new i would like to inform you that uh, we have divided our webinars into into three parts and uh, first of all we would like to introduce our speaker and then our speaker will Uh, deliver his piece and at the end we have a discussion session in that time anybody can join with us and you can ask question by commenting also so i think you have already come to know the title of this today's international physics webinar and title is the listening to the universe and our speaker is richard degrees professor department of physics and astronomy macro university sydney australia and we can see his uh, research and uh, educational research and career profile Dr Richard Degrees obtained his uh, PhD uh, from the University of Groningen in Netherlands and uh, in 1997 and subsequently he held two postdoctoral position uh, at the University of Virginia USA and the Institute of Astronomy University of Cambridge UK uh, before being appointed to a permanent post at University of Sheffield UK 2003 He joined the Cavell Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Peking University in September 2009 as a full professor, where he actively contributed to the institute's development until February 2018. Since March 2018, he has been a professor of the astrophysics and associate dean of global engagement at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Richard has been one of the scientific editors of Astrophysical Journal 2006 to 2012. He was promoted to deputy edit editor of the Astrophysical Journal Letters in September 2012, in which the role he served until mid 2018. He is the founding director of the East Asian Regional Office of Astronomy for Development 2012-2016. He also served as the international coordinator for China for the Institute of Physics uh, for, from 2009-2018. he was awarded the uh, awarded the 2012 shelby award for excellence in science by the australian academy of science it uh, 2013 visiting academy professorship at leiden university by the royal netherlands academy of arts and sciences in 2017 arts kin awards by the university of uh, canterbury and uh, in 2017 outstanding undergraduate in instructor award nominated by the student body at peking in university we can see his educational honorary position phd university of groningen uh, 1993 to 1997 and m phil in physics and astronomy the same university in 1998 to 1992 and uh, associate editor Uh, from 2000 uh, february 2021 to present journal of astronomical history and heritage and the uh, 2016 june to uh, up to uh, 
March 2022, Australia awards in Indonesia joint selection team, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And uh, April 2015 to April 2021, Discipline Scientist Astrophysics. And uh, uh, July 2011 to, uh, to present, International Journal of MCAs and AIDS. And uh, September 2002 to present uh, for Prize Fellow Life. And uh, his previous appointment, you can see his previous appointment and research project, star cluster, uh, then luminosity, young galaxy stars and this is awards and scholarship and this is his research gate idea you can see that his research gate point 46.12 and this is google, google score id and his google score point the citation is more than 10,000. and this is his orchid idea and this is his recent publication so thanks all of your patience now it's time to go to our speaker sir thanks again for accepting our invitation, sir. It's your time, so you can start your session, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, I will indeed start sharing my screen. In just a second. Share. And, right, is this visible? Yes, we can see, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to all of the students. <laughs> I just clicked it away, sorry. To all of the students in Bangladesh, good evening to anyone from Australia who might be listening. It's my great pleasure to address your students and I hope that uh, it will be inspirational uh, for them to ask questions. Feel free to ask me questions afterwards, uh, including by email, that's fine usually. Um, I'm an, as, as you just heard, I'm an astronomer and uh, I've been doing a lot of different things in astronomy. And one of the things that I would like to talk about today is what the universe would look like if we listened to it rather than just viewed it. So what happens if we convert whatever motion is out there, whatever pulsation is out there, whatever turbulence, etc., is out there into sound waves that we can hear with our ears. So that's the idea. Uh, but before we go there, I'd like to uh, first have a quick look at how we perceive sound, right? Sound is a longitudinal wave. And so here at the top, you can see some uh, air particles in black and a red piston that's going uh, uh, backwards and forwards to the left and right. Uh, that piston movement compresses the air molecules and uh, that, that leads to uh, longitudinal waves. Now that's similar to what happens when you have a sound source somewhere not too far away from you that hits your ear. The sound waves, those, those longitudinal waves go into the ear and hit the eardrum. And the eardrum then responds and causes um, a sensation that we experience as sound. So that's how sound works. So it's not a, uh, it, it, is a it is a longitudinal wave. Now, there is a lot of sound out there in the universe. And I'm not talking about the car driving outside your window or the wind whistling through the trees. But if we listen to larger bodies in our solar system and beyond, there are all kinds of sound waves out there. We just have to um, know how to visualize them. In my next slide, I'll, I'll play for you the sound of a 2011 earthquake in Tohoku, Japan. And you can see how that can be sonified, how we can convert the vibrations of the earth into uh, sound waves. And be careful, this is a loud signal. So really what we're hearing here are earthquakes. These are in essence surface waves and body waves. Now, this can go on for a little while. This, this happened in 2011, it was a massive earthquake. Um, Looking outside of the Earth mantle itself, if you look up at the sky and you're sufficiently far north or south, you see either the Aurora Borealis, which is in the Northern Hemisphere, or the Aurora Australis in the Southern Hemisphere. These are beautiful uh, streamers of uh, usually green lights, which are caused by very highly energetic particles that are streaming from the sun to the Earth. The sun as a star is made up of gas, um, it's bubbling up and uh, the sun is shedding, uh, shedding highly energetic particles from its outer surface in all directions and we call that the solar wind. And when those highly energetic particles get close to the earth, um, they are um, bent by the magnetic field um, 
uh, around the Earth. The Earth uh, has a magnetic field just like a magnet. That's why we have a North Pole, a magnetic North Pole, and a man magnetic South Pole. On the right-hand side of the picture here, you see the magnetic field lines of the Earth in uh, light green. And you can see that the solar wind, which are those whitish uh, flares coming off the sun on the left, are bent around the Earth's magnetic field because these particles are magnetic. That's just like an, uh, you had a magnet. magnet. Here you have a, a standard magnet with uh, iron filings, and you can see these beautiful magnetic field lines going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Um, the aurora, the auroras, the aurora borealis in the north and the aurora australis in the south can actually be sonified as well. We can understand or we can we can convert those motions in the atmosphere atmosphere into sound and these are called whistler sounds and they sound like this so these are the energetic particles from the sun whistling along the earth magnetic field lines um, in my next video we We'll see what happens when the European satellite, Betty Colombo, flies through the Earth's magnetic field. I'm going to stop this for a moment so you can hear my voice rather than the sounds. Uh, the European Bep Bepi Colombo satellite flew through the Earth's magnetic field about a year ago, and it has a very sensitive detector on board that converted the, the vari variations in the Earth's magnetic field into sound. And that's what you hear uh, in this brief video. And I'll see if I can play that again. So clearly, this, uh, there is no sound out in space, but this is a conversion of the variations in magnetic flux. Now, from a distance, uh, NASA has actually observed the Earth and mapped its vibrations, its turbulence, its atmospheric motions into sound. And that's what we're hearing here. This is radio emissions, natural radio emissions from the Earth. It's vibrations, it's minor earthquake that are earthquakes that are happening all the time on the Earth. Perhaps more interesting than this, perhaps more interesting than this, in the early 1970s, when NASA sent, satellite, sent astronauts out to the moon, you remember the, uh, the lunar landing, the first lunar landing in 1969, and then a few more in the early 1970s, the mothership was orbiting around the moon, and at some point they recorded a rather strange signal at the backside of the moon. And they didn't quite understand what that signal was all about. So let's watch the, the next documentary so you get a bit of an idea of what they heard out in space there. Noises reportedly were heard in May 1969 by the Apollo 10 astronauts as they circled the moon, a month before the first astronauts stepped foot on the lunar surface on July the 21st that same year. The three astronauts on board were Thomas Stafford, John Yon, and Eugene Cernan. The sounds, which lasted about an hour, were recorded and transmitted to Mission Control in Houston. I didn't need to see the sound out of space, did it? Did you hear that? That whistling sound? According to the Discovery Show, the trail felt the sounds were so strange that they debated whether or not to tell the chiefs and NASA, for fear they wouldn't be taken seriously and could be dropped it from future space missions. NASA says the sounds could not have been alien music. An engineer from the U.S. Space Agency said the noises likely came from interference caused by radios that were close to each other in the lunar module and command module. Astronaut L. Warden, who flew on Apollo 15, disputed that explanation, saying, quote, Logic tells me that if there is something recorded on there, then there is something there. Yeah, this is interesting, right? So this is the first time that we mention the possibility of uh, 
signals made by uh, some intelligence out there in space. And the first thing that people often think about is when they, they find something unexpected in space, that means possibly that there are aliens out there. However, if you look into it in more detail, uh, in, in this particular case, this was most likely radio interference. And as we will see when we go through the lecture today, there are many other uh, ex uh, explanations for strange sounds or strange uh, occurrences out in the universe, not necessarily alien life. So that's an important lesson. Alien life is, should not be your first explanation. Now, I would like to go on to my next uh, video now, which does the same thing to all of the planets and the sun in our solar system as we just did for the Earth. We map the vibrations of the atmosphere, the vibrations on the surface, quakes, we look at the natural radio emission, and you can see how the diff different, or you can hear rather, how the different planets sound. We're starting out in the far solar system with Pluto. Pluto was until 2003 a planet, now it's, it's, it's currently a dwarf planet. And if you have very sensitive instrumentation, this is what its natural sound sounds like. This is uh, 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 Neptune, the outermost gas planet. It's a very, very large planet with a very small rocky core and mostly gas clouds around it. Not much to hear because it's, it's just a homo homogeneous uh, gas cloud. Similarly, Uranus is a very large gas giant in the outer parts of our solar system. Small rocky core the size of the Earth with a huge gas cloud around it. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. It's famous for its red spot, which is in essence a huge hurricane. Uh, it's 300 times the size of the Earth. And this is Saturn, the famous ring the famous ringed planet. And some of that high-pitched noise came from uh, those rings. Venus, very close to the sun, very hot, forbidding. Uh, runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, this is the planet Mars, much smaller. Uh, poss can possibly sustain life uh, we don't know, but the Americans are looking for it right now. Here's Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. It's rocky, it's hot, and it's forbidding. And it's very small. Now the Earth we heard already. And finally, this is the, uh, the source of, uh, of the warmth in our solar system, the sun. The sun is a massive ball of gas. It's about four and a half billion years old, and it will probably, probably survive for another uh, four and a half billion years. The sun is a star, it's the nearest star. Most stars in the universe pulsate, vibrate, and make movements. Um, they have turbulence in their gaseous atmospheres. We can sonify those movements, as I will do in the next video, when we travel from the Earth to Orion's belt. You probably have all seen the, uh, the constellation of Orion, which has three stars in a, in a straight line, which is the belt of Orion. Uh, we're traveling at least some distance from the sun towards Orion's belt. And while we do so, we hear the sounds of the vibrations and the pulsations, and even the surface turbulence of some of the stars we are passing by. Normally, normally, we cannot hear these, these sounds, but these vibrations have been scaled up to the audible range for us to hear them. goes on for a while and I don't want to spend all of our time uh, listening to the stars which is beautiful after all but anyway um, you heard different pitches different different frequencies high pitch to low pitch that has to do with the size of the stars and we'll get to see that in just a moment 
But really what we're looking at here are the pulsations and the vibrations of stars like the sun. Uh, the picture at the top left here, the yellow and uh, blue and red picture, that's a star like the sun. Uh, and the picture at the bottom left is a red giant star, very, very large. The sun will become a red giant by the end of its lifetime. It will be so large that the Earth will no longer be able to orbit, to retain its orbit as it is now, because it will be completely engulfed by the outer atmosphere of the sun. Now, how do we know what these stars sound like or how they pulsate or how they vibrate? There is a branch in astrophysics called astroseismology. And the astroseismology maps the surfaces of stars and looks for um, uh, uh, motion or vibrations, uh, regular periods. And so in this case, what you see the top left is the sun. You have a few periods shown here on the surface. The star on the, on the, at, at the right here shows many periods. So stars of different sizes and different masses particularly have different periods. And actually that's being used not just in the field of astroseismology, but also in the field of stellar pulsation theory and distance determination to the nearest galaxies. Because it turns out, turns out that certain types of pulsating stars, um, their pulsation period correlates with their absolute brightness. That's what we call a luminosity or an absolute magnitude. And so by observing an apparent brightness, that's the brightness you see through your telescope, and comparing that with the expected brightness from the theory, you can work out how far away these stars are located from us. Um, so here is uh, a bit more of a background. This is about uh, the sun, and here are the sun's uh, vibrations. Um, in the same way as the sound wave resonates inside an organ pipe to create a musical tone, sound waves on a va far vaster scale can resonate inside the star. So in essence, vibrations are generated by turbulence on the star surface, and that goes inside, and then you get standing waves um, and uh, uh, oscillations, um, and depending on the star size and rotation. <clears throat> if you look at the graph on the top right here, you see oscillations, and these oscillations are oscillations in brightness as a function of time. The horizontal axis is a time axis. And so if you observe a star like the sun from a, di from a distance, of course, over time you see it getting brighter and fainter, fainter, brighter and fainter. That can be used to map the periods of the oscillations inside of the gaseous body of, of the sun. And it turns out that if you have a very small star, you get very rapid oscillations. That's the top picture here. Um, so that means very high frequency, like a piccolo. And if you have a very massive star, like the red giant at the bottom, you have very slow oscillations and you get a very deep bass-like uh, sound. So that's why small stars, high frequency, uh, very massive, very large stars, low frequencies. And that can be used to determine the ages of the stars. And that's shown here in this particular graph. Uh, if you look at the graph at the bottom left here, on the horizontal axis is temperature. Temperature is increasing towards the left. On the vertical axis is luminosity. That's brightness, and brightness goes up to the top. And you can see that when a star is very young, uh, and so we see a star like the sun at the bottom right, it says 5.83 million years. It sits somewhere on that white curve. It has a period of 1.83 hours. That's the period of the oscillation. Um, and then when it gets older and older, those are the pictures surrounding, let's see if I can point that out, surrounding the graph here, getting to older and older ages. And you can see that the periods in the top, in the top right corner of each of the, of the images uh, decreases. So the period also tells you something about the age of the star which is quite neat because we, we can't actually change anything in the universe, so we have to infer our information from external sources. These, are, these stars are actually protostars, and so protostars can be dated, so we can get their ages from the acoustic vibrations that they emit. So we've talked about stars. We've heard what stars sounded, sound like if you were to convert their pulsations into oral waves that we can hear. Um, and if you go slightly further away outside, beyond the nearest stars, we encounter some strange uh, objects out there. And here's one of them.
Now what this is, today we know that uh, object as a pulsar. Pulsar is short for pulsating star. But when this was first discovered by this young lady, and this was in 1961, um, the lady, her, the name of the lady is, uh, was at the time Jocelyn Burnell. Her name is now Jocelyn Bell Burnell. She found this object and she had no idea what this was. So this is very regular staccato rhythm of a star-like object. She had no idea what it was. So here, were some of the data that they obtained in 19, uh, sorry, 1967. Um, and you can see here, the, these are three bands of uh, graph paper. And you can see as a function of time, that the, 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 in the top band, you can see that the intensity of the radio wave that she, she recorded at Jodrell Bank Observatory near Manchester in the UK varied quite regularly with dips at very regular uh, time periods. Um, Here's another representation of that. Here are all of the um, pulses, as we call them, um, put on top of each other. And they all happen within a very small period of time each cycle. This uh, object is now called CP1919. The pulses occur every 1.337 seconds, so very, very rapidly. And we call these pulsars. Nowadays, we know that these are neutron stars that are spinning very rapidly. So what that means is a neutron star is the end phase of stellar evolution by the time a star almost dies. It's very dense. It uh, it's so dense that the atoms have been crushed and it's really all neutrons that are coagulating together in the star, very dense object. And that's ro rapid, is rotating in this case every 1.3 seconds. You can't imagine how, how fast that is. That is actually um, made it into the pop scene. There was a, uh, in the 1980s, there was a pop group called Joy, Joy Division, and they used that scientific image as their trademark. And this is actually from some of that, uh, 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 some, of, some of their, their promotional materials. So it's actually good that uh, even, you know, in, in pop music, um, some people at least paid attention to science. It doesn't happen very often. I'm looking at my next slide, so hang on. So really what, what did we see? We saw this pulsar. Uh, here again is a bit of graph paper. You can see uh, in, in handwriting, 19 hours, 10 minutes, 19 hours, 20 minutes, 19 hours, 30 minutes. And you can see um, the pulses um, indicated here. CP1919 shows you this pulse. Now, initially, Jocelyn Burnell called this, and, and her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, called this object LGM1, and because they had no idea what they were looking at. And LGM, in this case, stood for little green men, because they thought this was alien life. It wasn't, of course. What it was, is was a, uh, a, a neutron star. A neutron star is an object like the one that you see at the left here, which uh, has, um, which emits a jet of uh, highly energetic particles, in one in two directions uh, from its poles and is rotating uh, on an axis that's not quite aligned with the north to south pole axis uh, those uh, those elliptical uh, lines with the arrows are the magnetic field lines again just like we had them uh, surrounding the earth and so if that uh, if that that object rotates very rapidly you can imagine that the jet also rotates very rapidly as you can see uh, in the pictures at the at the bottom right and if the Earth happens to be in the way of one of the jets, we see it as uh, enhanced radiation, in this case, in the radio, just like a lighthouse going around, right? like this. Uh, by now, we have also discovered pulsars that are going around much more rapidly on millisecond time scales, so very, very quickly uh, spinning around. And one of the examples of that is the crab pulsar. I'll stop this here so you can hear my voice rather than the staccato rhythm here. This is a, a, a movie of the Krab Pulsar observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the satellite hanging at the top there. Um, and it is a millisecond pulsar, so it goes around very, very rapidly, ejecting this jet of highly energetic particles as it does, as it does go around. Now, the discovery of pulsars by this PhD student, Jocelyn Burnell, 
was awarded a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize for Physics in 1974, but the Nobel Prize was awarded to her supervisor. It was not awarded to Jocelyn herself. Um, obviously, the supervisor had a hand in the, uh, the design of the experiment, etc. but um, everyone these days believes that Jocelyn should have been part of that, of that award. She has become a very famous scientist in her own right, and she has won lots of awards, and she is recognized for her work, fortunately, but she never actually received the Nobel Prize, and that's unfortunate. Now, I mentioned in this context that initially they thought that the, these pulsars were little green men, alien life. And that actually spawned the idea that there might be a lot of alien life out there, we just have to find it. To the extent that there is even now an institution called the SETI Institute, where SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, that was set up and that has set up a whole array of telescopes like these, and this is called the Allen, Allen, Allen Telescope Array. Their aim, their, this is a private institution, their, in, their principal aim is to observe the sky in the Northern Hemisphere, because they're based in California and the United States, to search for radio signals that might have been emitted by intelligent civilizations. As far as I know, they haven't found anything yet, and uh, it would be quite a major discovery if they did, of course. Now, how many alien civilizations would you expect to be out there? That is not a question that one can answer quite easily, although this was attempted um, by Frank Drake in 1961, who came up with an equation which is now known as the Drake equation. It was The Drake equation gives you the number of civilizations we could potentially communicate with. It was never meant to be a real calculation, but it was meant to stimulate debate. But in, in any case, this is what he uh, proposed. The number of civilizations we could potentially communicate with is the product of the rate of star formation, so how many stars are being formed each year, times the fraction of those stars that have planets, times the number of planets that may have developed an ecosystem where intelligent life can live, can survive, times the fraction of stars that have actually developed life, times the fraction that developed intelligent life, however you, you define that, of course, times the fraction that of intelligent life that developed interstellar communication, and how long those civilizations actually live. Um, all of those fractions will be very small. So this number n will be a very, very small number. But it was never meant to be the, the result of a real calculation. It was meant, meant to stimulate debate. Nevertheless, that has not stopped people from, from using it as a, as a real predictor. And so, um, as I said earlier, whenever there is a strange signal out there from outer space, often some people, particularly conspiracy theorists, first come up with an explanation that it must be aliens out there. So here's an example. In 2016, um, in August 2016, uh, Russian observers with this object, this is a telescope, it's a big round circle with a, a, a linear array of uh, metal plates in the middle, called, it's called the Rattan 600 telescope, it's in the Caucasus Mountains. Um, they detected a mysterious signal in uh, the constellation Hercules. And so here's a picture of the constellation Hercules, and also you can see what the signal looks like. The horizontal axis, again, is time. The vertical axis is radio intensity. And this was only seen once and never occurred again. And this reminded them of another very famous radio signal from 1973, which is now commonly known as the WOW signal. And let me share that with you. In 1973, we didn't have very good visualization uh, programs yet. This is the discovery of the wow signal. You had numbers. Um, you know, you did your observations and what came out were these numbers. And if the numbers were bigger, you got a stronger uh, intensity or, or stronger detection. And so what is uh, encircled there in red is a very strong signal. And the gentleman who discovered this signal, uh, he wrote down wow. And that's why it's called the wow signal. And I actually have a brief um, video, uh, interview with the, with the guy, which I'd like to play for you.
60 QUJ5, the strongest signal I ever saw. That was exactly what we were looking for. You can search a lifetime and never find anything. It can take hundreds or thousands of years for a signal to get to us. It's hard to describe how modest our searches have been so far. I don't think many people have looked into it in much detail. It remains unexplained. I don't believe there's been any real definitive evidence of extraterrestrial life. Who knows what it was? We don't know what it is. And you can't say that it was aliens. You can't say that. With my red pen, I circled the 60QUJ5 and wrote the word WOW! Exclamation point. It is the best evidence we know of of coming from some other civilization. Right. Uh, that was interesting. Um, I don't think that everyone agrees with that conclusion that it comes from an external civilization. But any, in any case, so most of this was related to the discovery of pulsars, these rapidly pulsating objects. And more recently, our friends in China have constructed a very large radio telescope called FAST, the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. Um, so by definition, it's 500 meters in diameter. They, they constructed this telescope in southern China in a valley. So in essence, the telescope covers the entire valley and it's all metal. Um, the uh, circum circumference around here is about 1,600 meters. Uh, I've, act I've been here. I used to work in China for a number of years, and I've actually been here. It walks around. It took quite a long time to walk around. You have to wear a hard hat, etc. It's an absolutely beautiful area there. And I understand that the Chinese now want to build a few more of these to look for pulsars, ostensibly to do science, but of course, in the public mind, it's to look for alien civilizations as well. But the scientists won't actually say that because that's not what they want to do. Um, sorry, I should go back because... But now, what we have discovered with such large radio telescopes are what's called FRBs, FRBs, fast radio bursts. And here's an example of one of those fast radio bursts or nine of them. So what we're looking at is a radio signal, the blip that you just heard, right? Where on the horizontal axis is uh, time, and on the vertical axis is frequency. And you can see that as a function of frequency, the blip comes in earlier or later. That is because the signal goes, uh, goes through uh, what we call the interstellar medium, Three floating electrons in the Milky Way. And the, uh, those electrons slow down this, the signal for different frequencies differently. Here is an artist's impression of what, that, uh, what such a fast radio burst looks like. And we believe that most of these fast radio bursts, of which we have discovered several tens now, several dozen, uh, come from galaxies far, far away. And, we, and they are detected by our telescopes on Earth. Now, there was a quite funny uh, episode a couple of years ago where they used the Parkes Radio Telescope. This is the Parkes Radio Telescope in uh, the state of New South Wales in Australia. Uh, it's about a five-hour drive from where, where I am here in Sydney. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely gorgeous uh, place. Uh, the, the dish itself is about a 1,000 tons sitting on that building, and so you... you you wonder how stable it is, but it has been around for a long time. And this, the, the, the claim to fame of this particular telescope is that they recorded the signals from the first moon landing, Neil Armstrong and Buzz, Buzz Aldrin in 1969, and relayed that signal over to the United States. Now, the, fast, the Parkes Radio Telescope, and I visited there myself not too long ago, actually, just as a tourist, um, discovered at some point uh, objects they refer to as peritons. Peritons are those mythical animals like the one you see at the bottom left here. So again, what we see there, the, at the, the, the top, those graphs, you see a, a spiked signal. It says flux, so that is intensity, radio intensity. And on the horizontal axis, it's time, in this case, milliseconds. So as a function of time, you suddenly get that blip. Every so often you get a blip. And the scientists were a miss. They were like, we don't understand what could have caused this blip. 
And when they got enough of them, they started making plots like the one at the bottom right. This is a bar graph that shows when those blips occurred. So on the horizontal axis is the time of day. The vertical axis is the number of events they measured in a short time interval. And they realized that most of those blips occurred between 12 and 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's, that made them think. Now what happened? Um, this is radio, these are radio signals that were discovered. And they occurred because around that time is lunchtime here in Australia. And so someone opened the door of a microwave just a little bit too early, just before the food was completely done and the microwave stopped. And so every time that door was opened just a bit too early, one of those peritons was discovered. So it was not a real signal. It was actually a signal from a uh, not so intelligent civilization, from us, from humans. So that's, So you have to be very careful. Interestingly enough, the scientists actually wrote this up as a scientific paper, which was eventually published in one of the main journals in our field. And it's, it's quite a funny episode, actually. Um, but we do have real objects, and here are some real fast radio bursts. Um, uh, and they were also observed with the same Parks Radio Observatory. Now, when we go, so we, we are now talking about uh, radio signals coming from other galaxies, like our Milky Way, but really far away. When we go even further away, it, look, it turns out that galaxies like to sit together in large groups of ga galaxies, and we call those galaxy clusters. Um, my next movie shows you the, a sound wave developing in a galaxy cluster called the Perseus Cluster. And I'm stopping the sound here, but you can see what's happening. So a wave spanning some 200,000 light years is rolling through the Perseus Galaxy Cluster, according to observations from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, coupled with computer simulations. Um, the simulation shows the gravitational disturbance resulting from the distant flyby of a galaxy cluster, about one-tenth the mass of the cluster being simulated here. The event causes cooler gas at the heart of this cluster to form a, an expanding spiral pattern, as we saw, um, which ultimately forms giant waves lasting hundreds of millions of years in the outer regions. This kind of merger between clusters of galaxies, and we're looking at the gas and not at the galaxies themselves, but the gas that's actually sitting in between the galaxies, they are thought to occur uh, maybe every three to four billion years. And that's, so these are simulations. You can actually also see what they look like uh, in real observations. And that's shown in my next picture here. So on the left, you know, both uh, on the left is, a, is an optical picture of the center of the Perseus cluster of galaxies. The different colors show you the different uh, intensities or different densities of the different types of gas out there in the cluster. We don't see the individual galaxies. And if you then look at the very center, you can see that in the very center, we have, um, we have a black hole. And the black hole itself uh, is surrounded by some dark patches. And these dark patches mean that there is nothing there. So these are cavities. How do you get that? Well, the black hole emits, black holes are very massive objects that are so massive that not even light can escape from it. But what can happen is when these objects rotate around their axes, they emit or eject uh, jets of highly energetic material from their poles, once again from their poles. And those jets are particles, and those particles sweep away any gas that might be surrounding the black hole. So that's what you're seeing here, and that's shown in the next video as well. This animation shows how sound waves are generated in the again in the Perseus cluster from the central supermassive black hole and there you see those jets uh, emanating from the black hole and what it looks like in reality the gas that fills the cluster of galaxies is shown in red we do that again so you can see it again um, the animation zooms in to show the cluster's central black hole which is seen as the white point Next, blue-white jets of highly energetic particles and magnetic fields blow out from the black hole, forming these dark cavities in the cluster gas. When these cavities slow down, sound waves break off and travel away from the cavities. So that's what we saw there. A tremendous amount of energy is needed 
to generate those cavities as much as the combined energy from 100 million supernovas. Now, that is an exploding star, and you only get a star to explode if it is at least eight times as massive as, as our sun. The sun will not e explode. The sun will just fizzle out and become what's called a white dwarf. If you have much more massive stars, eight times, as massive, eight times as massive as the sun or more massive, they will blow up and become supernovae. So you need at least 100 million supernovae to uh, generate those cavities from the black hole. So the black hole that we saw was enormously massive down there. Speaking about black holes, you've all heard of gravitational waves, I think. And so what are gravitational waves? Well, these are caused when two black holes, like shown here in this artist's impression, spin around each other and eventually merge and collide. And you form a colliding black hole system, which generates uh, these gravitational waves. Um, the gravitational waves can be can be sonified as well. I have a brief video that actually um, explains this. So let's just watch the video. This is the sound of two black holes colliding and merging. Where did this sound come from? A long time ago, in the distant reaches of the universe, two black holes, each about 30 times as massive as our sun, were locked in orbit and spiraling in towards each other. The only visible traces of this spinning cataclysm would have been the way their gravitational fields warped the light of distant stars. Even as they collided and merged, there wasn't a flicker of light to be seen. The real and very violent action in the system was in the form of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space and time. These waves were constantly draining energy from the black hole orbits, leading to their ultimate collision and merger to form a single black hole. At that instant, the power of the gravitational waves was 50 times greater than that of all the stars in the universe combined. That pulse of gravitational waves, lasting only a fraction of a second, expanded through the universe, passing unimpeded through countless galaxies. About 1.3 billion years later, it reached Earth. Gravitational waves alternately stretch and squeeze space itself and everything they pass through, but the effect is minuscule. Their effect on Earth here has been vastly exaggerated to help visualize something that is otherwise invisible on this scale. To detect them and directly measure their properties, scientists built LIGO, the most sensitive measuring device ever made. LIGO uses a device known as an interferometer to measure the tiny displacements in space. In this simplified representation, a laser beam is sent towards a partially reflecting mirror and split along two paths. The beams travel along the four kilometer arms and reflect back towards the central mirror, which recombines them, directing their light to a detector. As the gravitational waves pass, the distance between the central beam splitter and the end mirror stretches along one arm and compresses along the other. This changes the time it takes the light to travel along the arms. The recombined light waves shift with respect to one another and produce a signal at the detector. Incredibly tiny stretching and squeezing of space can actually be measured directly in this way. How little does space distort to make this signal? Let's zoom into a hydrogen atom until we reach the proton at its core. LIGO is so sensitive it can measure changes in distance as tiny as a thousandth the diameter of a proton. And this tiny measurement made by LIGO was the final step in a journey that began 1.3 billion years ago in the distant universe when two black holes collided. Now those first black holes, that first colliding black holes that we found uh, were found in uh, 2015 and what you can see here is uh, pairs of black holes in blue here merging to form a new bigger black hole and on the vertical axis you see the measure of their masses expressing units of the mass of the sun so the first one was the biggest one uh, this uh, the sound you hear here in the background is the the chirp signal the signal the, the, the sound signal that uh, that you would hear at the end of this merger process now this led this discovery which was done by an enormous team of thousands of uh, engineers and scientists, led to the award of a Nobel Prize in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. 
So that was a quick Nobel Prize, two years after the discovery. Um, but to these uh, three gentlemen, Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorpe. Um, let me now take you to the edge of the universe. We've gone quite a long distance already, but really the edge of the universe is even beyond that. And this is graphically shown here. On the right-hand side is us. These are normal galaxies. The one at the, bot the bottom right might look like our Milky Way. And then going from right to left, we go to greater and greater distances. Uh, we see um, younger galaxies, which are not so well uh, shaped. Eventually, we see the, uh, the purple, pink, and uh, blue colors, which is what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang that put it all together. Now, you may have heard of the word Big Bang. Uh, it was a term coined by a, a, a British astronomer called Fred Hoyle at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. And he used it really because he didn't believe in the idea that the universe came from a tiny little point and expanded over time. But so he was a bit denigrating about it. But nevertheless, the term Big Bang still persists today. We can't see it because the time between the Big Bang and the, the echo of the Big Bang is not accessible to our instrumentation. It's because of a process called, called inflation, which I won't go into. Um, but we can see the echo. And so uh, the echo has been was first found by two American scientists called uh, uh, Penzias and Wilson. And let me just share a brief video with you about that. Oh, sorry, this is not uh, not the video. I was it's not a video. This is um, the cosmic microwave background radiation as we know it today. Uh, what we see here are very, very tiny fluctuations in temperature, with blue being cooler and red being hotter. But the difference is a fraction of a degree, a fr a, a one one thousandth of a degree, or much smaller than that. So those tiny little fluctuations, almost homogeneous, eventually grew and grew and grew and coagulated gravitationally until the first stars formed about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Those first stars got together and they formed bigger clusterings and groupings and eventually formed galaxies that evolved to the galaxies that we know and love today. That all started from tiny little density fluctuations, tiny little, little temperature fluctuations. And these were discovered by Arno Alan Penzias and Robert Rowe Wilson, who, re who received the Nobel Prize in Physics 1978 for their discovery of co the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now I'd like to share a brief video with you so you can listen to the sound of the Big Bang as if we could hear that, right? But it's been sonified, it's just the scientific data been sonified, and how this has changed over time as the universe expanded and the sound waves got stretched. Right, I'm stopping this here because the next uh, bit of the video is not so useful. Um, so we've come all the way from sounds on the Earth, the earthquake of Tohoku in 2011, to the edge of the universe in terms of the cosmic microwave background radiation. That's an enormous uh, uh, journey in, in just about 45 minutes or so. I found a very nice summary of this all in a three-minute video by Scientific American, which I'd like to share with you next. Have you ever wondered what the universe sounds like? I know, I know. Sound doesn't exist in space because there's no air for sound waves to move through. But there are signals we can translate into audio form. So what if we've replaced our ears with more sensitive instruments? Let's start close to home. Thousands of kilometers above Earth's surface sit two rings of charged particles called the Van Allen radiation belts. Disturbances in the radiation belts create the radio waves known as chorus. 
We can detect Corus on Earth, but NASA's radiation belt storm probes launched in 2012 are much closer to the belts, which helped them nab this incredibly clear recording. Corus isn't the only sound in our solar system. The sun also makes a lot of noise. Bursts of energy called solar flares produce radio signals that reach Earth. Here's a flare signal recorded earlier this year by amateur astronomer Thomas Ashcraft. <laughs> and what about coronal mass ejection? Massive amounts of charged particles that go flying off the sun at 200 to 1,000 kilometers per second. As these particles ping into spacecraft and other orbiting instruments, they pick up a signal that sounds like this. Another way to listen to the universe is to turn visuals into audio. For example, the twinkle of distant stars can be translated from light waves to sound waves. Take a listen. Based on a star's music, researchers can calculate its size and speed of rotation. And if we want to know what the early universe sounded like, we've got the Planck Space Observatory, which created the most accurate map ever of the light left over from the Big Bang, known as the Cosmic Microwave Background. Physicist John Kramer of the University of Washington turned all that data into audio files. These clips compress the first 760,000 years of the universe into seconds. You can hear the intensity of the cosmic microwave background increasing and decreasing. As the universe expands and stretches, the pitch gets lower and lower. So as you can see, I mean, here, even without sound waves, our universe is a pretty noisy place. For Scientific Americans, instant... Right, I hope I have convinced you that there's a whole lot more out there in the universe, not just what we can see or even just detect with our radio telescopes. We can actually uh, get a good understanding of what's out there in the universe by converting our signals, particularly the, the motions of uh, a variety of objects, into sound waves. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation, sir. So we have got uh, some questions uh, in inbox and in comment. If you allow, I can start the discussion session sir yes yes go ahead so first question in inbox how can we measure the time of the big bang <laughs> uh, that's a very good question thank you very much um, now it turns out that if we can measure how fast uh, objects are moving in the universe we use a technique called spectroscopy and so we look at um at lights so spect spectrum is um, uh, in, in essence, the distribution of light for different wavelengths. And sometimes you have these spikes in there or you have dips in there. That means there are emission lines or absorption lines. There's a whole lot of physics behind that. But we, we can look at the location in wavelength of those emission and absorption lines and compare them with where we, where we expect them those lines to be, which wavelength we expect those lines to be um, from theory. And the, dif the difference, particularly at, at large, at great distances, is a motion. And galaxies far, far away from us tend to speed away from us. There's no, on very large scales, galaxies move away from us at very high speeds. It turns out there is a relation between the distance of a galaxy that's moving away from us and its speed with which it's moving away from us. That's called the Hubble parameter, or the Hubble constant. And the Hubble constant is in essence um, a measure of the time since the Big Bang. So if we do a very careful job, we can work out when the Big Bang happened that way. Thank you, sir. There is another question. So we heard the sound of sun. So one of my students asked uh, of that, uh, how did the scientists measure the sound of sun? Ah, so what you do with, if you have instruments with very, uh, sorry, if you have satellites with very sensitive instruments like the SOHO satellite or other satellites that observe the sun or, or the planets, you can, you can, um, but we, what they do is they measure 
the differences in the intensity of the light. And they convert that intensity into sound waves. Right. So in essence, what you, the sun you were hearing, um, maybe some of the material coming off the sun or the turbulence of the sun. If you look, if you look at the surface of the sun, it's not a smooth surface. It's like the, the, the surface of a pot of boiling water. You have all these bubbles coming up. And the sun is just like that as well, with all these bubbles coming up. It's called overshooting. And so uh, that, that causes tiny little fluctuations in the intensity. And so uh, that can be sonified, can, make, can be made into sound. Sir, thank you, sir. We now take uh, the question from the comment, the first question. So, sir, uh, which one do we uh, support more, string theory or quantum loop? <laughs> I, I see that comment on my screen. Um, look, this is an area that's really not my area of expertise. From talking to my colleagues and from, from my understanding is that string theory uh, is perhaps more likely, but the problem is um, I'm a scientist who likes to see proof of things happening and we can't prove either string theory or quantum loop gravity because uh, it happens in higher dimensions or at such scales that we cannot observe it. Uh, so for the moment, I'm more comfortable with string theory, but you know, um, there, this, kind, this field is very rapidly moving and it's not an area I work in myself. Thank you, sir. This may be the last question. So can, you, uh, can we hear the Doppler effect uh, on these sounds? So the Doppler effect, uh, in principle, yes. So the Doppler effect is, in essence, the fact that so if someone is coming towards us, something is coming towards us, the, the pitch gets higher. If it's moving away from us, the pitch gets lower. It's not quite the same, but the fact that when galaxies move away from us, their light, their, their, the, wave, the wavelengths get stretched. When they move away from us, we say that, they're, that, that they are red shifted. So they're redder. And if, if some, something were to move towards us, the light would become bluer. That's a blue shift. It's not quite the same as, a, as, as, a, as the Doppler effect, but it's equivalent. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, we should uh, conclude our discussion session as we don't have any more questions. So thanks again for your wonderful presentation and nice discussion session, sir. My I would pleasure. like to say thanks uh, on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pavna University of Science and Technology for accepting our invitation. Uh, it, it was a great webinar with you. The main aim of our program is to motivate our students in this corona pandemic situation and uh, to support us uh, for this uh, program. Uh, we are very grateful to you. So thanks again. And hopefully in the near future, we'll arrange another interesting webinar with you, sir. Bye for today. Have a nice day. Good night to you. Bye, everyone.